All right, well, good morning again for the third time. <laughs> Pastor Craig and his family are out of town, so uh, I have the privilege of speaking this morning. Uh, I'm Kevin, if any of you don't know me, assistant pastor. And uh, yeah, so today we're going to be taking a look at, I want us to take a look at three aspects of God's love. Not that there are only three aspects of his love, but I want to just take time to focus on three of them today. Uh, we're going to have we're going to go through a lot of different verses. I don't have a main text for today, uh, so we're going to be going through a lot of different verses. So you can try and keep along in your Bible if you like, or they'll be up on the screen. You can just jot them down, and you can look at them afterwards if you like. But there are uh, quite a few scriptures, right? There's quite a few, yeah. And uh, so, just a, a warning for that. Is it is it kind of feeding back the mic? No, that sounds kind of weird up here. All right, uh, let's see, where are we at? So, as I said, I want to take a look at three different aspects of God's love. Uh, we all know as Christians that God loves us, right? Does everyone know that? We all know that? If you don't, then you know it right now. He does. He loves you. Uh, we grow up singing about how, you know, Jesus loves little children, right? All the children of the world. Um, all the different colors and everything. We grow up singing about that. Uh, we sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, right? So as Christians, we kind of grow up knowing and, and saying the right things and singing the right things. Uh, here at service, when we have service, we sing, like we sang today, Jesus, we love you. And, and we sing about how he loves us. And, you know, we, so we know as Christians that God loves us. We know it mentally. Sometimes we get caught up going through the motions and just saying the right things. Uh, sometimes we do that so we don't remember and we end up not remembering the importance of God's love. As we've been studying through 1 John on our Wednesday night service, we break up, uh, we have like discipleship groups on Wednesday nights, for those of you who don't come or maybe are thinking about coming. Um, sometimes people come and they see us break up under our groups and they're like, what is going on? This is Wednesday night service. We're supposed to be together. Well, we do things a little differently. We break up into discipleship groups. So basically a men's group, women's group, and then junior high group for the girls and junior high group for the guys. And, uh, and then we all study uh, scripture, that, the same passage together, uh, just, you know, whatever it is to our group. We talk about it and how it relates to us in our group. So with that being said, we've been going through the book of 1 John on Wednesday nights. And the main theme of 1 John is love. Love from the Father uh, love, loving the Father, love amongst the believers, amongst, amongst brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, this last Wednesday night in our men's group, part of our discussion uh, came on to the topic of, of knowing God's unconditional love. Uh, or we say, we know it in the Greek as agape love, right? That unconditional love. And it made me think, how many of us as Christians can confidently say that we know the unconditional love of Christ? Not know mentally, but know in our hearts. The Greek word for that is gnosko, like a man knows his wife, a wife knows her husband, to know intimately. How many of us can confidently say, don't raise your hand, but just think, how many Christians, young or old, age-wise or young or old in Christ, can confidently say that we know, we know intimately the unconditional love of Christ? If you're like me, I know this mentally. I know it in my head. I know that that's what the Bible says. I know that's what we're taught. I know to say the, that's the right answer to say. But there are times in my life where I can, I can honestly say before you guys that I don't know it, that gnosko no. I'm not experiencing that unconditional love of Christ. So much of what we know about love, both mentally and physically, is based on our interaction with other humans. And so this can alter our view of God's love for us. And so that's why this morning I want to take time to really focus on these three areas of God's love and how it affects us, how it applies to us as Christians in our daily relationship with the Lord. Let's go ahead and pray for the, the teaching. Dear Lord, we, th we thank you for this time to study your word. We thank you for this time to look at what your word says about love, about your love, and how it applies to us as Christians. I pray right now that you would just anoint me as the messenger this morning to speak your words, to speak your heart to your people. I pray, Lord, that you would use me as an instrument in your hands, an instrument for your voice, to speak to us this morning. 
Everything that I have to say, that I want to say, that I think would be fun to say, cool to say, good to say, deep to say, it doesn't matter if it's not from you. And I recognize that. And I recognize that before my brothers and sisters this morning humbly. And so, Lord, I say that because I just want to ask for your anointing. I ask that you would speak through me, Lord. And, and for all, the anointing for all of us from your Holy Spirit, anoint our ears to hear what you're saying to us this morning and anoint our hearts to receive and to allow your word like a seed to be planted within our hearts. So we ask that you would come here right now and just speak to us, Lord. We want to hear from you. Can you just say that this morning, church? Speak to us, Lord. We're listening. And we ask you to be here with us. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so as I said, I want to take a look at God's love from three different aspects. You could kind of break it down to the past, the present, and the future. So the first point for today is that God loved us the way we were. God loved us the way we were. The main verse for this point is Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says that God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Before we were saved, before you were a Christian, God loved you. He loved all of us. He knew what we were like. He knew uh, what we were into. He knew what we were involved in. He knew what we had done as a sinner, all the good and all the bad. He knew uh, what we believed. Some of us believe some pretty crazy and wacky things before we come to know the truth. And uh, yet he still loved us. Knowing all these things about you, things that if we were to say to each other, we'd probably never talk to each other again, right? We think, oh, okay, stay away from that weirdo. You know, all those things, God still loved you unconditionally during that time. And he displayed this love on the cross. The cross was God's ultimate demonstration of his love for us. But it's also the ultimate demonstration of man's hatred towards God. Here he is, Son of God, God come in the flesh. One week before the cross, we as human race were worshiping him, singing Hosanna, you know, come Lord, we're, we're giving him praise, we're honoring him. Six days later, we're saying crucify him, crucify him, kill him, we don't want him. We want you to release a murderer, a, 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 a thief instead. You know, we, we want you to crucify this man. So it's the ultimate demonstration of God's love for us, but it's also the ultimate demonstration of man's hatred towards God. Yet, knowing that that's what we were going to do, and even in the midst of it, knowing that we were turning our backs on him, the creator, he still loved us. And he went through with the act on the cross, of going through. he went through with that action to display, hey, even though you hate me, even though you are turning your back against me, I still love you. Knowing who we were and what we were like as humanity and each of us as an individual, God still chose to love us and to demonstrate that love for us. Romans 5.10 says that God restored our friendship with him while we were still his enemies. When we started out here on earth, we were in friendship with God, right? Humanity. Adam and Eve walked in the garden with God. They were in fellowship with him. Then sin entered the world. And because of sin, we became enemies with God. Because everything that sin stands for is against what God stands for. And Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. There's no middle ground. So we were enemies of his. If you ever feel that you are a really bad person before Christ, just know that you are worse. Just a little encouragement there this morning. You know, you were worse. Whether you think you were just a little bit bad, or you think you were the worst sinner of all, uh, you were worse. You were an enemy of God. But not just you, all of us. We were enemies of God. Now that is not something that you want to hear when you go face to face with God, right? The, the creator of heaven and earth, of everything that we see, the keeper of life and death, right? You go before him and he says you're an enemy of his. Whew. That is not something that you want to hear. That's not something that anyone would want to hear. But God's real, and he's honest, and he says, you, are, you were enemies of me before you accepted me. You were an enemy of, of mine, of, of what I stand for. So even though we were enemies of God, he still loved us. 
And he didn't avoid us. He didn't leave us alone. He didn't punish us. No. Instead, he sent his one and only son to die on the cross, as we read about in John 3.16, right? 1 Timothy 1.15, some verses to back this up, says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save the healthy, to save the perfect, right? No. He came into the world to save sinners, Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 5, But God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. Jesus Himself said in Matthew 18, 11, that He came to seek and to save the lost. And then in Ephesians 1, 4, Paul tells us that before the foundations of the world, God chose you and I to be with him. I think you guys get the picture. It's important for us to remember that before we accepted Christ, God was loving us the entire time, all along the way. When we were unlovable, he loved us. Why? Because he's rich in love and mercy, as we just read. We didn't do anything to earn his love. We didn't do anything to make him want to save us. He simply did all on his own. So why is it important to us as believers now, why is it important for us to remember that during that time, God loved us? I mean, we've already realized that. That's why we gave him our lives. That's why we accepted him as our Lord and Savior. So now that we've been Christians for maybe a little while or for some of us a long while, why is it important to still remember that? Because there are times in our lives that we allow the mistakes of our past life, the sin of our past life, get in between us and God. Sometimes we focus on the past and we feel so guilty. We feel ashamed of all that we had done. And we grow, we kind of distance ourselves from God. Some of us maybe feel, some people feel that they need to be punished because of those things. And so they punish themselves. We allow the enemy the demonic realm, to imprison us in guilt and shame, even as a Christian. And maybe some of you here, maybe some of you can say, I haven't ever experienced that. But there's plenty of Christians out there, maybe in this room, who have experienced that. They're walking as a Christian, they're saying, I'm a Christian, but yet I still feel so weighed down because of the the stuff that I did. I feel horrible. It's constantly, the enemy is right there, constantly reminding me of that. Constantly throwing that into my mind. If you've ever led anything as a Christian, like in the church, a Bible study, a group, a home group, small group, maybe it's taught from a pulpit, youth group, Sunday school, some of us, you'll know, when you go up to speak, all of a sudden you get some pretty weird random thoughts, memories from your former life, from things that you've done. And for some of us, things that we've done even in Christ, but we'll get to that a little later. But the enemy is right there to throw that in our minds, to throw it in our face. And some of us become imprisoned by it. And we walk through the Christian life, letting our former life weigh us down. If God were all about punishing us for our actions and guilt-tripping us and shaming us, he wouldn't have died for us while we were still in that state. Now, don't get me wrong. There's consequences, right? If a person chooses to reject Christ and not follow him, there's only one place for him to go, and that's hell, him or her. Okay, so there are consequences for our decisions, for our actions. But God is still right there loving us. And he doesn't send someone to hell to punish them, to get back at them. But it's because there's only one of two places you can go. And you can't enter heaven without accepting him as your Lord and Savior. And so they end up going to hell. So, don't get me wrong. This is not, or God does allow consequences for our actions and our decisions. But it's not to punish or condemn us. It's to teach us and to strengthen us. Don't allow the memories of your past life before you were a Christian separate you from God. He isn't pulling away from you because of what you've done. You're pulling away from Him, not remembering and believing in His grace and forgiveness and mercy. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, these are some verses to encourage us, to remind us of what God did on the cross. Peter tells the people to repent and turn away from sin so that their sins will be blotted out. Blotted out. You ever see uh, something written on a piece of paper and, and an ink spills on it? Whoa, hello. Ah. 
There's something funky going down up here at the sound. Um, you can't read it. You don't know what was written there before. You, don't see, you can't see what it was. So that's what Christ did with our sins. When we repent and we turn away, notice he says both, repent and turn away from your sin, turn to God, your sin is blotted out. Uh, and Isaiah, Isaiah told us that we're washed white as snow. Jeremiah 31, 34 says, God says that he will remember our sins no more. Psalm 103, verse 12, he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. We need something to be done with the sound. All right, much better. I agree. Thank you. Um, so where were we? Micah 7, 19. Once again, you will have compassion on us. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. Uh, we call that the sea of forgetfulness, right? And Pastor Craig mentioned a few weeks ago, there's a famous picture someone drew. You know, there's a big old lake, and it's, it says the sea of forgetfulness, no fishing, right? Get it? Okay, no fishing. You can't take it back out. God makes it a point in his word to tell us, to remind us that our sinful past, our sinful past lives do not affect his love for us. He has done so much to relieve our consciences from our former lives. So why do we need to be reminded of this? I believe we do because, as I mentioned earlier, we base so much of our, in our relationship with God, we base it on our interaction with each other, with fellow humans. We tend to not forgive people for past mistakes. Uh, we tend to, or we like to hold grudges against people. We like to hold their mistakes over their heads. We let those things lessen our love for each other. When we learn of someone's past, we let it affect how we view them. And so when it comes to our relationship with God, we assume that he's going to treat us the same way that we treat others or have been treated by others. That's why Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that we are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And then Romans 8.1, we read that there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. So we need to drop the past. We can definitely learn from it, right? But we can't let it creep in between us and God. He loved us the entire time. If your sinful life would have made God hate you, he wouldn't have died for you and I. He wouldn't have offered us forgiveness. So it's important for us to remember that God loved us. Knowing what we were like, knowing what we were doing, he loved us the way that we were. The second point this morning is that God loves you the way that you are. 2 Timothy 2.13 says that when we are faithless, he is faithful to us. As Christians, we go through seasons where we are close to the Lord, we enjoy his presence, uh, all is well. And then we go through seasons where we get caught up in worldly pursuits. Uh, we might get caught up in sin. We get caught up in maybe just depression, frustration, anger, at what's going on. We kind of give in to the pressures of this world and the worldly things that go on around us. We then feel that we have let God down. If you're anything, if you're like me, I know that when I've gotten caught up in these things, I tend to feel, man, I let God down. God doesn't want to be anywhere around me, doesn't want to be near me, doesn't love me right now. Again, we know the right answers to say, but do we feel it? Oftentimes, no. You know, we, we feel that you know, God is pulling away from us. God doesn't want anything to do with us. We start feeling like he doesn't love us. But that's not the truth. It's partially true. God does, God does get angry with us when we're in sin, but this doesn't mean that he hates us. It doesn't, or it just means that he's not happy with us at the time. Parents, you can relate to that, right? Your kids have done something that angers you, frustrates you. You don't hate them. As humans, we might be tempted to say that. Some of us have said that. But we don't feel it, Right? Is this feeding back now? Okay, that <laughs> scared me for a second. All right, so you don't hate your children, but you're angry with them. God is the same. He's the same. He'll be angry with us for sin, for willful sin, willful rebellion, doing things that we know that are wrong. I don't remember where it says it, but I think it's in the New Testament where it says that what a man knows to do but does not do, 
It is sin to that man. So when we do things that we know we're not supposed to do, it's sin. And God does get angry. He does take sin very, very seriously, even with us as Christians. But that does not mean that he does not love you. Now, as I'm going to talk about a little later, but I want to point out right now, that doesn't mean it's not an excuse to sin. It's not a license to sin. It's not okay to sin. Just because we know, well, he might get angry with me, but hey, he still loves me. So, woo, party, let's go have some fun. Let's throw off the restraints. No, that's not what we're supposed to do. But my point is, is that uh, God loves us even when we're in sin as a Christian. Many times when people say that God loves you the way you are, they stop right there. Their goal is to make you feel happy and to feel good about yourself, right? Sometimes we'll go and we'll want prayer, you know, we'll want help or advice. We'll say, man, I screwed up. I did this. That. And they say, it's okay. God loves you. It's okay. Don't worry about it. He'll take care of it. God works things out for good, works all things out for good. Okay, that, that, that's true. But if that's all you hear, then we're going to be trained to believe that, hey, I can sin and there's no consequence. Hey, I can do, I can screw up every once in a while, and it's not that bad. God doesn't get upset. But that's not true. God does get upset about it. He does love us the way we are, but that doesn't mean that he's happy with what we're doing. We see this happen time and time again throughout the Word of God. Uh, one, one man of God that I've always liked studying about is King David. Uh, many people like to. My middle name is David, so I kind of have a little bias towards David. I like him a little more than probably others. But David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then killed her husband or had her husband killed. You can read about that in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And we see that God was angry with David. And he allowed consequences because of David's sin. But that didn't make God love David less. He still loved him. David later on did a census of his army when God very clearly said not to because he wanted David to just trust in him, to rely on him. Instead, David said, okay, but I want to see my strength in numbers. I want to see how many people I have. And God was very angry with that because David directly disobeyed him. But that didn't make God love David less. There was consequences for the sin, major consequences, but that didn't make God love David less. Each time we see David repent and seek God's forgiveness, God gave it to him. No matter what you and I do or go through as a Christian, God will never stop loving us. As I said earlier, that doesn't mean that we won't experience consequences for our decisions, for our sin. That's God's way of, of dis, uh, disciplining us, right? It says in Proverbs 3, I believe 16, that God disciplines those that he loves as a father disciplines his favorite son. He allows consequences not to hurt us, not because he's angry with us, but to teach us, to discipline us, to teach us not to do that again or how to do things differently. No matter what you and I go through, Oh, I said, you know, God will never stop loving us. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we won't miss out on the blessings of a fulfilled life. This isn't an excuse to sin. Okay, I need to be clear on that. This isn't an excuse to take a break from Christianity or from living for God. There are some very clear warnings in Scripture about being stagnant, about pulling away from God, about doing our own things as a quote-unquote Christian. Revelation 3, 15 and 16 is probably one of the most common verses said on this subject. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now there's... Endless debates on what that truly means. But if you read that at face value, I think the last thing that you and I should want as a Christian is to be spit out of Jesus' mouth. I don't see how you can be in heaven if he spits you out. You know, if you read it at face value. Now, you can get into the, you know, the, the, the nitty-gritty of all that stuff, the debate of back and forth and stuff like that. But, guys, just read it at face value. That's not something that you should want to have said of you. That's nothing we should want to, that's not something that we should want to experience. I, mean, I want to be with Jesus all the time. I don't want to be spit out of his mouth, right? What do we do, do with things that are spit out of our mouth? You know, we won't go there, but it's gross. We, we trample it. We, you don't want to talk. You don't want to think about it, okay? We don't want that with Jesus. Uh, Jesus said himself in John 15, verses 1 through 7. I'm going to read these seven verses. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. 
You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, verse 5. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse 6. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. We cannot mistake God's unending, unwavering love as weakness. We cannot use it as an excuse to sin. Remember what Paul says, does that mean that I should sin? By no means. All right, just because you've been saved by grace, just because you're, you're saved in him, you're, you're free, is not an excuse to sin. 1 John chapter 3 talks a lot about how a true Christian does not make a practice of sinning. God's love should make such an impact on our life that we do not want to allow sin in our lives. But when we do find ourselves in sin, that doesn't mean that God will no longer love you. It's kind of a fine line to balance here. You don't want to just say, God loves you, you're good the way you are, go for it, just keep doing what you're doing. You know, but then you don't want to be too hard and say, God hates you, what are you doing? Ah, you know, it's a fine line. You don't want to give people excuse to sin, but at the same time, we want to know that you know, when someone is in sin, when you're truly repentant, you feel horrible, you do want to know that God still loves you. He loves you. That's why he died for you. That's why he gave his son to go through what he went through was for you because he knew of the sin in our lives. 1 John 1.9 tells us that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. He's writing that to Christians, to believers, saying God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. As Christians, when we sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us all the time. John 10.29 tells us that nothing can snatch us out of the Father's hand. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says that I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to se separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you read this in Romans, you can't help but just sense the joy behind these words. I believe as Paul was writing it, that he's smiling. You know, he's probably writing it in big letters. You know, guys, God loves you and nothing will separate you from that. Don't believe the lie that says you sinned as a Christian, you're going to hell. No, he loves you. He loves you. No matter what you've done, no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're going to do, he loves you and he always will love you. Let that be an encouragement to you. That when you found that you've gone a wrong way, you've gotten caught up in the world and sin, let that be an encouragement to you to know that God loves you. Not, as I said, not to continue in it, Right? When you find yourself in that situation, you realize you've done wrong. You're in sin. You're going against God. That's the time to repent. That's the time to say, God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And just go back to him. Turn away from those things. For those of you who have sin in your life and you're not convicted, you're not doing anything about it, I want you to know again this morning, that is not a good place to be in. We'll talk about what to do in just a few minutes because I want to go over the third point first. So God loved you the way that you were. He loves you the way that you are. The third point is that he loves you enough to not leave you the way that you are. What does that mean? Well, thank you guys for asking. I would like to explain that to you. Yes, God loves you the way that you are, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't want you to grow. He loves you the way you are, but he wants you to grow in him, to become a stronger Christian, to stop struggling with some of the things you struggle with as an early Christian, to stop dealing with that stuff, to move on from those things. The Christian life 
is a life of transformation. Our transforming and learning and changing, it does not end here on earth. It doesn't end until we are in perfection with Christ, which is when we're in heaven. But until then, we need to keep pressing in to the Lord. We need to keep fighting the spiritual war. We need to keep learning how to be more like Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 13.5, Paul tells the Corinthians and us to examine ourselves to see if our faith is genuine. He says, test yourselves in this. This is something we should be doing our entire life as a Christian. The Christian life is not about coasting. It's not about taking it easy. It's not like you accept Christ and you're done. You know, that's not the finish line, okay? That's the starting line. The finishing line is when we're with he- with heaven, when we're in heaven with the Lord. So what is Paul saying when he says to test yourself? He's saying to ask yourself, am I really a Christian? When you accept Christ, we have the assurance of salvation. We give him our life. But there are some people who think they are saved because they prayed a prayer when they were younger. They assume that they're saved when they aren't, just because they went through some motions or they said a couple things. They think, okay, now I'm saved and that's it. So how do you know if you're truly saved or not? Charles Spurgeon, he's the prince of preachers, He said this about this verse. He said to go out into this world and see what type of piety you have. So what he's saying is, I had to look up the definition of piety. Basically, piety means being religious, living for God, you could say. Not religious in a bad sense, but having a relationship with the Lord. Go out into this world. So from here today, after we leave church, go into the world, go back home, go to your jobs, go to the grocery store, Do you act like a biblical Christian when you're in those areas? Are you living out the things that you read in God's word and the scriptures? Are you conscious conscious of the Holy Spirit living within you? Are you sinning less? You know the cute saying, we'll never be sinless, but we can sin less today than we did yesterday. Is that true of your life? Are your sin struggles less severe than when you first accepted Christ. Christians who have been saved for many years should not be struggling with the same sin for that entire time. That's not a popular thing to say in today's society when everyone is trying to comfort each other, make everyone feel good, everyone's a winner, everyone gets a trophy, everyone can use the same bathroom, right? (laughs) There is distinction. And when you're a Christian... If, you're a, if you've been a Christian for 10, 15 years and you're still struggling with pornography, you're still struggling with maybe something as basic as stealing, you're still struggling with a dirty mouth, guys, there's a disconnect there. Because the Christian life is about transforming. It's about changing. We'll never be perfect. Don't hear that. There's still times where you might have struggled with, with sexual immorality as a young Christian, There's times where you've let that go. It's not a big issue anymore. You're years down the road, and you still get that temptation. It's going to happen. We live in a very sinful world. It's everywhere. But are you still giving into it as much as you did before? See, that's the key. How to know that you're really living the life Christ has called us to live is are these sins becoming less and less severe in your life? So I just want to be clear on that. Just because you might struggle here and there does not mean that you're not saved. But if you can struggle, quote-unquote struggle, we like to use that word as an excuse, if you can go through the same sin constantly and not have to change, not feel conviction, not feel anything, that is the time where you need to say, Christian, am I saved? Because if we're saved, we should feel that conviction of the Holy Spirit. We should know when we're doing something wrong. There are certain areas of our life that may always be a struggle to some degree, like pride or jealousy. But how we deal with it and how quickly we deal with it should change over time for the better, not for the worse. Romans 12, 2 says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. 
Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Notice that Paul says, learn to know. Then you will learn to know God's will. We need to learn to know, and we do so by not conforming to the world, but by allowing Christ to change us and to renew our minds, which we do by reading God's word and through prayer. Also, we should never be comfortable around sin. If we're comfortable around sin, there's a problem, right? Christ died to forgive us of sin, but if we have no problem being around sin, eh, and you say you're a Christian, eh, that's the time to say, am I saved? Because I got all this sin around me and I don't feel a problem with it. That's not good. We're called to be holy as he is holy. That holy doesn't just mean morally. It means to be set apart from sin, to be set apart, to come away from those things. Now, we know through reading scripture, right, Paul talks about it a few times, you're never going to get away from it in this world. But if you're okay with it, that's not good. I have a kind of a weird example of that in my life. This last Friday, I was outside uh, pouring, mixing concrete and doing some stuff out there for the new lights at the, do you guys see the new parking lot, by the way? Pretty nice, huh? Pretty sweet. So we were, we're putting lights on, on the other side, so I'm out there. They came out, and they striped and put the parking bumpers down. And uh, talking to this guy, he says he's a Christian. He's not as strong anymore. Uh, you know, says, well, it says he's Jehovah's Witness, and that's a form of Christianity. And so we're talking about these things, and he's just, he's just cussing away, all right? And uh, I, it was weird. I don't know if any of you felt this. If not, then just label me a weirdo. It's okay. Everyone does. So... I'm sitting there, I'm listening to this, and all of a sudden I can feel my flesh perk up. Kind of like, ooh, someone's saying naughty words. You know, someone's saying bad things. You know, this is kind of thrilling. This is exciting. Oh. And then all of a sudden I feel my, my spirit like grieved, you know, the Holy Spirit within me grieved, like, oh, I don't want to hear this. And I could actually feel for like a split second just that, that inner struggle, that inner battle. So what did I do? I just started cursing like a sailor. It was great. Just kidding. <laughs> Some of you are like, what? <laughs> I didn't. But I made it obvious that I wasn't thrilled about the language, and he apologized. You know, He didn't stop, but he apologized for it. <laughs> but that's what happens. You know, if you can feel that kind of, uh, but then you just go for it, for sin, that's not good. Or maybe you don't even feel that that uh, part, and you just like, hey, yeah, bloop, 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 and you go along with it, or, you know, maybe it's not even language, maybe it's talking dirty stuff with the guys at work, or maybe it's, it's looking at pornography, dirty things, or, you know, things that aren't pornography, but are still stimulating to the, the flesh, you know, if you can look at that stuff and not feel bad, you got to check, <laughs> so you got to check yourself before you wreck yourself, but you got to check your relationship with Christ, Test yourself. See if your faith is genuine. As I said earlier, why am I saying this? Because we never should never stop transforming as a Christian. There might be times where you do give in, but you feel bad. That's the time to repent and turn away from it. Don't give in to it anymore. Learn from it. Be different. Be holy. We experience an initial transformation when being born again. Right? We're now, as, it says, as I said earlier in 2 Corinthians, we're in a new creation. Okay? We are transformed. We're transformed in God's sight. He doesn't see us as a dirty sinner anymore. He sees us as a clean saint in his eyes. So there's that initial transformation. We're a new creation. But there's also a transforming that takes place throughout the entire Christian life. If you talk to old Christians, they'll agree. Oh, yeah, you never get it down. You're never perfect. You're still learning. Up until the day that you die, you're still learning how to be more like Christ. The mind needs to be renewed, and that can be a constant struggle between the flesh and spirit. It's this struggle that teaches us how to behave differently, what to do, what not to do as a new creation. We are constantly learning, either from mistakes or from training our spiritual ear to hear the Holy Spirit uh, guide and direct us away from mistakes. So where are you in Christianity? Are you stronger in Christ than when you accepted him? Or are you still struggling with the same things? Wherever you are, God does love you still. And you need to remember that. But he loves us enough not to leave us the way that we are. 
He loves you and I enough to say the hard things, to deal with the hard issues, to help us change so that we don't have to deal with the consequences of sin our entire life. He wants us to grow in our walk with him, growing to depend on him, to trust him, to follow him no matter what. 2 Peter 3.16 says that you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So how do we grow? Well, he said it in his first letter, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment, Peter says. Then you read in Hebrews 5.12 that spiritual milk is the basics of Christianity. So in order to grow in Christ, we need to know and remember the basics of Christianity. We could spend all day going over the details of what the basics of Christianity are, but the Apostle John said in his first letter, summed it up in John, 1 John 3.11, that the message we heard or learned in the beginning, the beginning of the church age, the beginning of the New Testament, when Jesus was here, the message that we learned or heard in the beginning was to love one another. How do we know how to love one another? By Christ's example, he laid his life down for us. The unconditional love that is unearned and unmerited, yet freely given to us. You see, God's love is the foundation of our faith. It's what Christianity is built on. If we forget about his love, the basics of Christianity, which is God's love for us, if we forget about that, we forget about what his love means, then we forget the basics of Christianity. If we forget the basics of Christianity, then we fail to grow as a Christian. God loves you and I so much. He loved us before we knew it or before we even cared. Like I used to tell the, the youth group all the time, God loved you and had a plan for you before you were even a twinkle in your grandmother's eye. He was there planning you and loving on you already. He loves us knowing we have issues. Some of us have got some issues. He loves us knowing those issues, and we are learning, and when we are learning and doing our best to change those areas and allow Him to change them for us. And He loves us so much that He is teaching and training us to be holy as He is holy. So, are you experiencing God's love in your life? Are you remembering how much He truly loves you? When we do, that's what encourages us to grow in Him. That's what encourages us to put an end to willful sin in our lives. That's what encourages us to stay away, to become, become like him, be holy as he, as he, be holy as he is, to pull away from the things of this world, to pull away from the worldly pursuits and the worldly lusts and the fleshly lusts. Are you experiencing God's love? In closing, I'd like to pray for us this morning. So you can go ahead and shut the lights off and Rachel and Matthew, you can come on up. But if you feel like you've not experienced God's love in a while, or maybe you've never experienced that unconditional love from God where you know that he loves you, I want to take a time, a moment to pray for you right now. So would you guys close your eyes? And if you feel that that's you this morning, like I said, I want to pray for you. So if you feel that, would you please raise your hand so that I can pray for you right now? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for what you did on that cross. We thank you for the ultimate demonstration of your love. And we thank you that you love us, God. We thank you that you love us the way that you love us. You don't love us how we as humans love each other, but you love us unconditionally. There is nothing we can do to make you not love us. There's nothing we can do to make you take your love away from us. You always love us. You've always loved us. You do love us, and you will always love us. And we thank you for that this morning. Right now, I just want to pray for those that rose their hands and those that, that wanted to but maybe were afraid to or just didn't. I pray that you would just shower them with your love right now, Jesus. That you would just fill this place with your Holy Spirit and with your love, God. Let them know how much you love them right now, Lord. 
Pour your love on their hearts. Pour your love in their minds. Speak to them in love about the areas that you're wanting to change, the areas that have been keeping them from, from fully experiencing all that you have for them, God. You are such an amazing and good God. Like we sing here, you're a good, good Father. And I pray that no one would leave this place without experiencing your love this morning, Lord. We thank you for your love. We thank you that it's your love that encourages us to stay away from sin. We thank you that it's your love that encourages us to just get away from the things that cause us to struggle. We thank you that in your love, you give us the power and strength to say no to sin, to say no to those sinful relationships, to say no to those people that are trying to pull us away from you. Some of us are struggling with that, I believe. I feel that in my heart. Some of us are struggling with being pulled away from God by people around us. And you're saying to us this morning, you're saying to them, I love you more than those people do. Don't pull away from me because of them. They'll let you down, but I will never let you down. I love you too much to let you down, son or daughter. Leave them, put them away, and follow me. Again, Jesus, we thank you for your love. As we leave this place this morning, as we go back to our homes, to work this week, Whatever it is that we do, let us take this with us, this message of your love. Being encouraged and built up and edified, knowing that you, God of all creation, of heaven and of earth, you, God who keeps everything spinning, <laughs> you love us. And let that love, we pray, let that love strengthen us to not live a life of sin, but to live a life of holiness this week. Let it start with us, Lord. And I pray that your love would flow through us and affect the lives of those around us. That we will have opportunities to share your love with those people, with sinners, with people who don't know you, or backslidden Christians. We ask, Lord, that you would use us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for all that you've done for us, Jesus. And again, help us to apply this message from your heart to whatever it is that we do this week and for the rest of our lives. And before we close, Lord, we want to lift up and do a special prayer for what's going on in Orlando. If any of you didn't hurt here, there was a mass shooting last night at a nightclub in Orlando. I think close to 50 dead, more than that injured. Know. They, they, they know it was an act of terrorism, but they don't know. They believe that he was Muslim. That this, that's, what char that's what charged this uh, attack. But uh, Lord, we just want to lift up to you the situation over there. We pray that you would comfort those that are hurt, those that are mourning, those that have lost. We pray that you would, again, show them your love. We pray that they would come to know you through this experience, Lord. That they would realize that, hey, there is some crazy junk in this world. There is some really bad stuff. And that that would spur them on to turn to you the truth and give their lives to you. I pray that you would comfort those over there. Comfort them. Be with them, Lord. Use this to bring glory to your name and help the authorities, the, the feds and the local authorities to figure out, get to the bottom of this and and Lord, as, as uh, my dad joked this morning, here comes another reason to get rid of guns. I pray that that would not happen. But I pray instead that this would be another reason for there to be, well, it is another reason, but that we would realize this is just another reason for there to be an awakening in this country. That we need to turn back to you, Jesus. We need to turn back to being a Christian nation. And that we take these things serious. We don't allow these things to just take place on our soil in, in the face, spitting on in your face. Lord, I pray that this would encourage the believers here in America to stand up, to take their our, to take our spiritual lives with you serious. Because at the same time, you know, this is this is devastating, it's drastic, it's horrible. 
it still should serve to remind us that our lives can be taken away at any moment. We never know what's going to happen. So I pray that that would encourage us in two ways. Number one, that our lives would be right with you, that we would be living our lives right with you every day. And when we find that we aren't, that we'd quickly get back being right with you, God. And second, that would encourage us to share your gospel with those around us, to share your gospel with those who could be killed in an instant, who could be gone. Use us to proclaim your good news to them, that you are their savior. You died to forgive them of their sins. So Jesus, we thank you so much for all that you're doing and all that you're going to do, Lord. I pray that you would bless the rest of this day and this week. Help us to live for you, to walk in your spirit, to glorify you in everything that we do and say. And to, like I said earlier, that cute little saying, to sin less today and every day than we did the day before. We thank you for the empowerment from your spirit. We thank you that you've enabled us to do so. I pray that we would live it out. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You guys can stand. We're going to worship with one last song. And uh, let's do uh, And then um, if you need prayer for anything, you can come up here and uh, I'll pray with you. Some of us, Rachel can pray with you, Matthew, and I can pray with you guys. So if you need prayer, please come up and pray. If not, uh, or even after you prayed for, have a blessed day. Uh, be sure to check out the coffee bar, all right? It's got some great coffee, some caffeine. Some of you need caffeine. <laughs> I noticed. I <laughs> don't think I didn't. So uh, grab some caffeine and use the patio to hang out and fellowship. And uh, yeah, God bless, guys. Have a great week. <laughs>